Welcome to Shorty Supercoach and today we're going to have a look at the Western Bulldogs as our final preview on Shorty's shortlist as Supercoach 2016 gets released tonight which is exciting so we're going to have a look through the dogs and be sure to check out all my other previews on my channel and certainly on the Supercoach HQ website they're also available there. Now the doggies have a few interesting prospects but they do have one man that is definitely a must have and he's Tom Liberatore, a past favourite of ours when he broke out in 2013 with 106.8 average dominated in 2014 110 average there and look he missed last year as we all know with an ACL injury did that in the NAB challenge which is extremely disappointing for him but look what do we know about Libba is he does it all basically he's an inside monster wins so much footy in that inside contested area and he tackles averages eight tackles 7.1 clearances last year he could probably win a little bit more of the ball but that's also by the nature of the way he plays the game he doesn't win as much outside footy because he's the one on his knees inside on the contest feeding it out to the other players on the outside so the way he plays just adapts perfectly to the Supercoach scoring system. He just racks up points with the ability to score big, big numbers with tackling, clearances, contested ball. That is so important in the Supercoach system. It's why I talk about it often when previewing players. And look, we can get him at 357k, which is pretty delicious, dare I say that word. He's an absolute lock as far as I'm concerned. Yes, his only query in the past has been that he probably hasn't handled a tag very well. But of course, the Doggies broke out as a team last year. And there's much more players to worry about as far as an opposition point of view when looking to assign a tag than just Liberatore. Once upon a time, he could be shut down. At times, he was in certain games, despite those very good averages. But now, I think he's a man that at that price, you just absolutely lock in. Yes, he's coming off a knee, so we probably won't see his best football of his career. But I think at that price, we're certainly going to see some really good stuff. And by all reports, his, his rehab's gone pretty well. He's a bit of a um, different character at times and finds a way to get in trouble off the field but I think physically it's gone pretty well off the field for him so he should be back and should be playing good footy monitor it I think it'll be in everyone's team if he's lining up round one no doubt Lockie Hunter is another man who was high on my radar until he lost that uh, forward status he's just a pure midfielder now Average just 77 last year, which is, you know, that's okay, I suppose. He upped his average 17 points from 2014, but the real numbers are in that back half of the year. I'll run you through his season last year. Came into the side about round six, it was. Two sub-affected games in round six and seven. Round eight he played. Played okay, but he was out of the side. Played a bit of VFL footy, uh, footy throughout that time. Came back in round 15, sub again, sub affected games in round 15 and 16. But then, obviously, those games that I've just said that have all been sub affected with low time on ground percentages, that's why he only averages 77 because of that. Whereas if you look at his numbers from round 17 heading into the elimination final, those final eight games, he averaged 29 touches and 103.9 super coach points. That's a very, very nice reading for a guy you can get at 77 average. Why did he get that? Well, he moved into the midfield and he found his role. He, just, he hadn't quite found it as a footballer. He had a bit of uh, controversy with the betting scandal at times early last preseason, I think it was, and it didn't quite happen for him, but he found his feet at AFL level. He'll probably receive a bit more attention this time around, and I think he may find himself on the half or flank and not right in the inside contest all the time with Libba returning. He'll certainly be a great player, and I could probably see him averaging around that 100 mark, but as a pure mid, I don't think you can pick him because, as I say time and time again, picking a midfielder, we want to be going upward of 105, 110 if we can. You get about 415k, which is quite offering a bit of value, no doubt. But I think, as I said, losing that mid-forward status hurts him big time and you probably wouldn't look at him. Maybe for draft, though. Jackson McRae is one of my favourite players in the league. He is an absolute ball magnet. The query on him, I'll start with his query because there's only one really, and that's been his disposal efficiency. He can throw in the old clanger, and he has been put back to the twos at times for not working hard enough. His defensive aspect, and I'm not talking tackles because he averaged 5.6 tackles last year, which was a big improver. He had breakout year in 2014 where he went from 61.4 average to 100.1, racking 
backing it up and last year averaged 99.9 .9. so basically identical numbers not only in the super coach but when you look through most of his stats they're pretty similar the big mover was the tackles so he responded to some of that criticism on his defensive side of the game averaging 1.5 more tackles per game and he obviously has to work harder the other way too but I'll be looking at the positives here. 26.4 touches per game, 4.6 marks, find plenty of space around the ground. The tackles, as I mentioned, 10.4 contested, so he's not just limited to the outside. Four inside 50s and 4.5 clearances. That's ticking each and every box as far as you're concerned, scoring potential. Yes, he can probably sharpen up on the defensive work, but I think as a former number six pick, 55 games and heading into the 22nd year of his life, I think he could be a player who's just reaching his prime and we could see big, big numbers. I wouldn't have the guts to pick him at that 99.9 .9 average because it doesn't offer great value and he doesn't offer a hell of a lot of surety as far as top averages, but... I think he's a guy I'll be looking at certainly in draft. And if you're feeling gutsy and you like McRae as I do, he could expire. That's how I feel. He could go bang and could have 105 plus a year. That's my thinking anyway. So have a look at him. But nonetheless, he's going to be a favourite of ours down the track, I feel. Kieran Collins, just a debutant. I'm sure he'll be a debutant this year, but he was just drafted. Pick 26 for the Dogs. And the reason I put him in is because the Dogs have been looking out for a key defender down back. They found a couple of makeshift players last year with Hamling and etc. I'm not sure they've absolutely found that key post they're looking for yet. Collins could be a man who will put his hand up. 194 centimetres, 95 kilos. He's ready to go at AFL level. That's been all the talk. And at pick 26, he was widely expected to go higher than that. So he slipped a bit, and by that reckoning, we can get him in the defence for 117k, which is quite nice, I think. He's a guy I'll be looking at, of course, with these rookies. You probably tell that I haven't looked too far into the rookies because, to be honest, before we see much NAB challenge, and obviously those are round, round one teams, you can't really look too far into the rookies because the guys I had last year penciled in, and then all of a sudden they're not named or on extended benches, etc. But Collins is a man that I definitely think could play quite a bit of footy. And if you don't have him around one side, he may feature later in the year. Matt Suckling is a guy that, you know, some may look at in the defence and really go, oh, gee whiz, Matt Suckling, great kick reasonably priced I think what the average there 73.4 so he's down on what he can do but tread with caution with suckling I think there'll be a lot of appeal for perhaps the lesser knowledge people to go oh gee we suckling love the kick can kick a long goal lock him in don't do that I don't think he's a guy that you'll be looking at too closely I'll tell you why his averages have gone peaked in 2011 with a 90.8 82.7, did the knee in 2013, then 77 and 73.4. He's never been able to find a stack of the footy. In those years, he's averaged between 19 and 21 touches per season. That's handy numbers, mind you, but he relies heavily on disposal efficiency and even more so his teammates giving him the ball, which is the biggest question mark. He's averaged year to year 4.1 to 4.9 contested possessions. And his uncontested ball has been 14.4 to 15.2. So he's floated in very close ranges. That's consistency for sure. But that contested ball number is extremely low. And he even has a tendency to really turn the ball over at times too. Because he goes for so much with his kicks, he backs himself. If he hits that kick, it's beautiful. But he's more likely to take higher risk with the kicking because he's more confident. And as we saw last year, he has at times been able to turn the ball over. He even played forward at times, which affected his average. But look... Going to the dogs, he's going to wear the number one Guernsey. He'll probably take on a bit more of a leadership role. At times in that star-studded Hawks lineup, Suckling was somewhat of a cameo role. And I do feel that his average could boost up to 85+. plus. I know I bagged him out at the start of the segment. You give him it as a backman or a forward. But I would be steering clear. I mean... I'd be keeping him on your radar if you're really looking for some value, but I think there's some great value in the defence this year with the likes of Melcheski. I know Yaron just got injured as well, but there's a few players down there which I'll look into closer down the track that do offer some real good value. Suckling will tempt a few. I'm more inclined to say no. He relies too heavily on too fewer things, and if they go off, he returns. Sure, if you're looking for a safe 70-80 bet, go for it but I really don't think he's offering enough top end stuff he might go 85 90 and you may if you believe you can do that you might think about it but for mine at this point in time especially without seeing any nab challenge 
he's probably a no for me. But anyway, we'll move on to the package. Jake Stringer was named by Brian Taylor as the package. And I'll agree, he's pretty much got the lot. Except the super coach scores. That's right, he only averaged 78.8, somewhere in that vicinity last year. And you wouldn't be fooled into thinking, even me, later last year I was going, gee, Stringer's in a hot run of form. I wonder how he'll be next year. You know, he's probably averaging around the 85, 90. Because you tend to not look too closely into too many other players when they're not relevant at the time. I looked at his average, it wasn't too crash hot. Yet he seemed to be playing some great footy. And the reason being, he just doesn't find that much of the ball. The reason being I've put him in here, though, is because he's always been linked to that potential midfield role. He's only 192 centimetres, so it doesn't leave him as an absolute key forward, even though he's been playing very tall and playing it very well. 56 goals, 32 behinds, that's plenty of shots on goal, and he does do the brilliant stuff. He can find the footy, sell a bit of candy, kick the big goal. We know he can do that, take the extreme stuff, but he probably doesn't do enough of it. His quality is there, we're just looking for more quantity of it. So, he showed the brilliance as we know. He uh, only four centuries last year, which was surprising but I think his ceiling was shown against the Crows when he was subbed off in the third term, still racked up 128 supercoach points, kicking the six majors. That's what he's capable of. As I said, he does need to win a bit more of the footy, but he may have been held back by having to play more of a deeper forward role. I think potentially he could move into the midfield at some point throughout his career because he's not a marking player either. Only averaged 3.5 marks. Only took 12 contested grabs for the year. So he's more of a mobile player. Perhaps you could link him to a Lance Franklin who'd rather play higher, work his magic up there. He's more mobile. But there has been that link to him playing midfield at some stage throughout his career. NAB Challenge will define that for us and if he is fighting through that midfield getting a bit more game time you may think about it if you're a fan of the package but for mine I might be looking at him in his draft but as I said probably not a guy you'd be going with given there's a fair bit of risk for him in your super coach classic. That's a wrap up for the dogs as I said off the top liver I'd absolutely be locking him in. There's a few other options there that you might think about. I'm not strongly endorsing too many of them, as I've said, but certainly if you to keep on your radar, they offer a little bit of value, but you're going to have to have a few pills as well to pick them because you've got to be a fairly brave man at that price because they could go bang or they could go bust for your side. And when a mid-pricer goes bust, that really hurts. So that's a wrap for the doggies, and it's a wrap for Shorty Shawlis. So I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed that channel, that uh, segment, sorry. And look, There'll be plenty more Supercoach content coming your way. Supercoach is released tonight at midnight, so get on that. And as I said, I'll be looking into my team, what I'm looking for in the back line, midfield, forwards, rucks, etc. And plenty more down the track. We'll have a look at a few of the top-up players for Essendon and some of the younger guys in a closer look at them, who you should be having a look at. So give the channel a subscribe, the video a like, all that stuff. Give a comment if I miss someone. Give me your thoughts on a few of the Doggies players. But no doubt, keep clicking back because there'll be plenty more Supercoach content coming your way.